brand, something that, you know, when someone looks at Richie Bites, what do they think of? What do you think they should think of? Eric, start us off. <laughs> Um, so one of our popular models that we build is our gravel bike, gravel on off road. Um, I come from like a big road racing background, so a lot of our time that I focus on tends to lean kind of road heavy. Um, but our our gravel bike is a disc brake on road off road bike that can run dual tire sizes. Um, I don't know. I know it made all to explore anywhere type of bicycle. So if you saw something like that, um, maybe from like a, from a frame perspective, and then we, we do a lot of kind of custom paint, so anything you'd see with like a bike that had paint that would bring us the personality of customers. Okay. Kind of like the our, customer's touch. Yeah. Okay. Kind of our, kind of our, I like it. Uh, I would say the adventure road bike. I think of it as sort of a rebel road bike. It's a more of a old school thing that can do travel or dirt roads. Um, it's something that I've been interested in riding for a very long time in Jamaican. So I think that uh, I've kind of been associated with that. To do um, it's a little more, um, it's a unique bike, so very purposeful in the design. that maybe is left behind by the mass market that's trying to do a racing bike or a more mountain bike style gravel bike. Nice. I would say that uh, probably either my breakaway road or my breakaway cross bike. Um, I think for me, it's all about uh, how much you can do with the bike and where you can travel with the bike. How how difficult it is to travel. Uh, it wasn't always that way with me in the beginning of my my, uh, my cycling business and, and uh, career. But I think as as uh, as I see people wanting to uh, be as mobile as possible, be as free to, free as as possible, and not being you know uh, all that you know as conscious as okay, I've got this bike doing this, and I've got this bike that can travel, and you know, I'm trying to make a, a very lightweight, functional uh, bike that you can travel with, that is your every bike, too. It doesn't, it, it just, that just disappears under your legs. Um, probably is, is as much my ethos as, as, as I can, you know, kind of like describe. Travel's a big component, yeah. and then kind of like, again, to do it all. Yeah, yeah, cool. and the bike just kind of, uh, you know, there's no real compromise to the to the technology. It doesn't really add weight, and it, uh, it, uh, it and it's plenty strong uh, for any application. Yeah, my wife and I just came back from uh, a big trip around the world, and, and we used uh, the tandem, which uses the same couplers and, cool. and technology, and uh, you know, it's, it's, it's very us safe. Awesome. Yeah. Cool, Sam. So we only make three bikes, so Tom had to choose from like 10,000 bikes. Yeah. <laughs> um, so we make a, again, fat tire road bike called the Alcohol Road. I think it's, we just we just want bikes to be fun. We want people to be able to get out and just have a good time on it, not be so serious about it. And I think that's a, that's what that bike's all about. Okay. It's just going out, enjoying it, not taking yourself too seriously. Do a little bit of this, a little that. Fat tire road. Yeah. Okay. Let's hear it. Um, well, my, my, my current road bike, the, the Simpson, the future is now. Uh, it's, uh, it's made to be like a timeless, a timeless road bike. I want it to be cool. It's cool now, but we would like it to be cool 20 years from now. It's designed yeah. to be timeless and also robust. So, you know, when people sort of ride it over it, you know, on dirt and the road and everything. What makes it made, robust? It's, it's pretty overbuilt. Oh, yeah, well. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it's also very lightweight, so it's designed to the frame. It, the frame is very light, but uh, it's not like delicate. Okay. So it's it's a bike. You know, I want people to ride it for you know twenty years from now. Maybe who buys it now? You know, later. You know, when their kid grows up and goes to college, it's like yeah. here's the bike. Take this with you, and then they can lock it up or 
race with it or you know just race it or ride it every day. So the common theme is kind of a, a bike that does a lot of things. A, that seems to be the trend right now. Um, Sam, what when you think about bike design, what are some um, variables in, in designing a bike? There's like, there's a million here. I know, but like yeah. for us out here, what, I mean, we want a little insight into when you're designing yeah. a bike. So you have to, like the first thing you have to start with is intent. Like, so how do intent. you want, like what, how is that thing gonna be ridden? How do you okay. want it to be ridden? What's the experience you want that person to have on the bike? Yeah. You sort of start there and then you sort of bring in all the things that are gonna make that experience as good as possible. Um, so obviously, if you're talking about a race bike, it's you're talking about you always start with geometry. Yeah. Right. Then that, you. That's something that I think is a little lesser known too, though the geometry maybe then. So it all starts at geometry. Yeah. Right. Because you have, and geometry is not just the way you fit on the bike; it's the way the bike handles, the way the bike steers. Mm -hmm. So you've got, you know, how the person's going to sit on it, which dictates a lot of things: how comfortable they are, where their weight is on the bike. Yeah. Um, then you've got your rear center, front center. Your offsets and uh, trails, all those things play a huge role in what you want a bike to do. And it, it's, it changes wildly from how you want a bike to handle for, you know, cruising around town or a race bike or a dirt bike. Yeah. So that's where, that's where it starts. Intent. From your, like, you're a mechanical engineer, right? Yeah. In that background. Is that, um, is that a pretty, like, fun, I, like, process for you? Yeah, of course. Yeah. I mean, it's most... It's most fun if you're trying to, there's like a problem in there too. Mm -hmm. I think if you're just sort of going down the path of doing this and doing that, the most fun is when you run into something and you're like, okay, I don't know what to do now. And you sort of have to work your way out of a box. That's that's when it gets. So what would a problem be? I mean, in bike design, you guys. Huh. Internal cables. Internal cables. <laughs> <laughs> Tire clearance. Tire clearance. Tire I like overlap. Yeah. To overlap. overlap. What's something that you run into, Aaron? Um, tire size, drive train spec, kind of depending on what the rider wants. Okay. I would say in terms of geometry, usually I get to design for my customers. So each person brings their own set of um, strengths and maybe weaknesses. So being able to fine tune the geometry a bit to enhance their abilities and sort of uh, cushion the areas that they're not as good. So like as a rider, they tell you their strengths and and to some extent, to... you get a sense like somebody's, you know, wicked fast to send or somebody's like, well, I kind of take it easy. My friends are faster. This really makes me nervous. Yeah. You know, I would design these, those two bikes differently. Totally. Okay. Um, what's, what's the next, um, kind of moving on just a little bit, what's the next radical change in bikes that you guys foresee? <laughs> you got something here? 3D printing. 3D printing. Yes. Yes, and uh, you know the uh, well. I use a lot of three D printing for my bikes, so all the molds actually are three D print, and um, and I developed this way. I mean, you know, I don't have a multi million dollar facility. Okay. I have a small three hundred square foot shop in downtown LA. And we're talking what material? Carbon fiber. Okay. And um, I don't think uh, well for me like a three D printer just you know made it so much easier to make a bike that will compete directly against, you know, specialized. Yeah. And, and, and a similar price point too, you know? And uh, it, it cut my work down so much by being able to make all this specific tooling. Yeah. That, uh, you know, I don't have to send out or you know, spend a lot of money on or like, you know, lift heavy molds. I can actually right. make, a, you know, a custom frame with a custom molds at a, you know, at a better price point. And cut my work down quite a bit. I cut, cut the errors down. Right. You know, cutting miter, like miter tubes and stuff like that. Like I developed this way of, of making frames because I was tired of cutting tubes wrong. Right. And I was like, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm like, I, or like you know, spend the whole day. You know, there's all these measurements I gotta take, and then there's these cuts, and and eventually I was like, I'm gonna cut these tubes a little longer, but and then like spend and then sand down the tubes and check, you know, sand them check. And then, in coral fiber, it's toxic. It's, it's not a fun material to work with. And uh, you know, so you have your mask, and you have your your ear your phones, and a dust collector. And it's not like it's not it's not a fun thing to do. It's not like you have like your wooden tube blocks and your filing tubes. You know, it's like it sucks. So <laughs> how many people are at your shop? Two. 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 Okay. 
And uh, so the way that I, that I, so one of my frustration of uh, just, you know, cutting tubes wrong, I made it uh, in a way that I can actually cut, you know, it's one measurement, one cut, round tubes, and then all the pieces fo like fo fit in like puzzle pieces. Yeah. And they, but you know, if it's it's frustrating when you're working with a client. Well, it's frustrating for the client, and embarrassing for you when you uh, when you're when you're. You know, a client waited you know, three, four months for their bike, and, and then they get it, and it's slightly off, right. you know? And that's insanely frustrating. And then also with carbon fiber, the material is very expensive. Is that something that, like, those of you that work with carbon, is that something you're doing as well in 3D printing? Or you guys discuss, like, what would pros and cons of this be? We don't do, we use 3D printing for prototype. But there's for doing custom geometry, and there's there's really some benefit there. Uh, the question was about the next great advance in bikes. Is that what it was? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I think I was talking to what's your name again? Martina. Martina. I was talking to Martina about this when we were uh, before. One of the coolest things about bikes is if you look at a silhouette of a bike from 100 years ago to today, it's like almost the same. Yeah. Like things haven't really changed that much. And everybody is in love with bikes. We have this sort of desire to, to sort of improve and tweak and make it better. And it's a hundred years of evolution to get this to the point we are today. But there, it's not like there's Junior. there's no huge advance. I was talking it's about like, hundred years when I was building my first bike. <laughs> <laughs> In about hundred and forty. But I guess my point is the iterative thing, right? Yeah. You know that the thing that sort of knocks you over the head and it's like the next big thing. I mean, it's. Yeah, but okay, then yeah. how about this? What was the last radical change in bikes? Was there something? The last radical change? I think the thing that's opened up the design envelope more than anything else is disc brakes on road bikes, probably. I think okay. all of us have sort of experienced the kind of freedom for tire clearance yeah. with that. Um, before that, it's material stuff, you know? I think it's, it's, it's nothing insane. Maybe radical was. Yeah. I mean, we're relatively speaking. Yeah. Maybe from like a tech side, like definitely like materials and like component spec, but I think availability as well, like what the consumer gets to choose now is like huge. Yeah. Like you can choose from so many different makers and so many different companies and like what everybody's offering is so like, and we can all sit here and say like, I mean, you know, that we're all different, but we're all kind of similar and, you know, bikes haven't changed a whole lot, which is totally true. But like from a consumer standpoint, like there's a thousand more options than there was a hundred years ago. Right. And so the customer's ability to choose is, is probably one of the biggest advancements, right? Like 10 years ago, you couldn't find somebody on Instagram, follow them and get hyped on it and then yeah. buy a bike from them. Like that, that, that didn't exist 10 years ago. Um, and I don't know, I think that's like a huge aspect of like how it's kind of positioned cycling in the market, like just availability in general and the ability to buy from like small makers and the ability to buy from small individuals or big players or, and for the consumer to get what more or less what they want. So from a customer or consumer perspective, you feel like their experience has been the biggest difference? Yeah, I mean, yeah. I think I would say yeah. also like with that explosion of what's available in parts, it's like gravel bikes have been a really popular category now. But what it is to be a gravel bike, it's really a broad spectrum. Yes. These are some very different options available within that space, somewhat driven by components, driven by technology available to produce that, material selection. So in terms of like what's next, we've seen things have been shifting around that space a lot. And it's unknown how that how much it would settle in and when, but that seems to be a big area of flux. Yeah. What do you think, Tom? You've been in this industry how long? <laughs> what did you say? Seventy-two. <clears throat> Seventy-two. Uh, 72. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> um, you know, I, I guess the, uh, the benefit of, of seeing you know almost fifty years and starting out in uh, in a creative place, Silicon Valley having engineers as fathers and mentors and being um, being in an environment that basically uh, thought it did it didn't really you know um, didn't really 
need a YouTube or a piece of information or whatever, just kind of, you know, extrapolated from some image in their mind, how it was done, you know, what, how did they make this, and, and, and working your way backward and possibly working your way into another way of making it and a new way of making it. Titanium came from, uh, popularity of the titanium telluride came from California. Carbon frame came from California. The, uh, the evolution of steel came from California uh, uh, with my company uh, early on. I would say we're in a wonderful place right now. It's a soup, soup du jour. It's like the anything you want, everything you want, experiment to the max, circle of, of evolution coming back and landing basically almost in um, what I'm hearing, you know, uniformly is the gravel bike. The gravel bike was the utility bike of my, of my, of my youth. Because, been doing it for years. <laughs> yeah, because basically it was a, it, a single purpose bike and, and, and the racer in that, in the 60s and 70s would be really thankful to have at minimum one bike and two sets of wheels. And that was, that was his number one you know, kind of tool in, 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 in the sport. And it turned out to be, you know, the same bike that we rode for training, which we rode off-road, which we rode with a different set of wheels. And, and the clearances of the bike were important. The clearance of the bike needed to be, I mean, if you look at the older bikes and the Richard Sachs, it was just, you know, showing me my bread. It had the same clearances as the clearances that I grew up so on. So you, it's already existed is what you're saying. You in the 60s and 70s, this gravel bike already existed. The gravel bike has you're always really, existed. Yeah. You know, what we're really good at these days is marketing. <laughs> and, and, and it's fine. It's getting yeah. people, it's, what, what I like about it is the latest, greatest thing is the back to the future experience of getting back on your bike and just riding it off road and not worrying about it. Yeah. Okay. And so for me, I got a tandem, it has 30 seat tires on it. My wife and I are, are riding anything we want with it, for the most part. You know, level two mountain bike trails. Um, nice. You know, and, and if you've got the skill, the thing, the thing that people don't realize is a gravel bike for, for a road cyclist teaches them to ride a bike better. They have to, okay? In my day, a road bike, if you rode it off road, teaches you how to ride better. A cyclocross bike in the, in the heyday of mountain bike racing taught you how to race a mountain bike better. Anything that was 700 C wheels that was a that was intended to be you know partially off road or whatever ended up teaching you how to handle a bike. As soon as we got bikes that basically had every kind of suspension travel imaginable, yeah, or electricity, it made it more fun. Know, <laughs> yeah, there you go, you're being my the antagonist. <laughs> as soon as you got all all those choices, which I'm not gonna comment are good or bad because it's a very neutral yeah. uh, and subjective no, totally. thing. Because at eighty or ninety years old, those things are gonna be awesome. Yeah. You know? But <laughs> <laughs> All right. conversation all right? all right so kind of a segue into the next question do you think uh the bicycle design is behind the times compared to other industries i disagree no <laughs> i know <laughs> the answer is no the answer is no. The, answer is no the one thing that i well you actually see this a lot in mountain bikes okay and full suspension mountain bikes if you compare the, the like the suspension, the, the suspension system on a current mountain bike and compare it to a motorcycle, mm -hmm. like a dirt bike. Like the, you know, a, a Honda XR or whatever has the same bike from 1986 and yeah. the one from now has the same system. Right. Hardly really anything has changed. Okay. In a mountain bike, it changes like every other month. 
you know, so, and it's insanely hard to keep up with it, and, you know, I'm not trying to, I, I made a, a full suspension mountain bike in, in collaboration with a client, and he was explaining to me the whole thing, and I was like, you know, you're paying for it, I'm like, I don't, <laughs> you know, like, I'll make whatever you want, but I don't, I don't get it, yeah. and, um, you don't take them out, right? but, uh, <laughs> if, like, if you, if you look at, um, if you compare it to other industries, like, yeah. in, in motorcycle, in motorcycles, or, even in cars, cars. I mean, that's, that's, that, that's currently changing now from like a combustion engine to electric engine. A bicycle, like, there is, I feel like, I feel like the bigger brands are, um, is the theory that I have. Okay. But, um, <laughs> so I feel like, like, you know, if you compare, if you look at uh, all the big brands, so they're all kind of like pushing it, making it harder for guys like us to compete. So they come, you know, they they make oh we're gonna make this aero bike, yeah. Then we're gonna make this aero bike that has all these integrated cables and no exposed cables and stuff like that. And then I'm already designing one, but uh, like for for like the steel guys, it's like how am I gonna make all these cables like disappear, you know? Yeah. And and in a way, like just because it's new, it doesn't mean it's better. Well, how about for someone who works with? steel or metal, uh, what do you guys think? Do you think that bikes are behind the times? Like cars have had dis, I mean, I don't know how cars work, but cars have had disc brakes for a it's been a while. It's been a yeah. while. Yeah. I can't imagine cars have candy. I think that the bike space is <laughs> highly, highly innovative and there's a lot of new things, but not all of them stick because some of these things don't add to the experience. It's like it yeah. might add to the cost, it might look different, so it's cool that year, but you know, it's like there's trends that kind of people try and it goes away, but we're ultimately trying to make a bike that's, you know, even whether it's 17 or 20 pounds, it's very light for what it's asked to do, and it's very simple, and that's part of the beauty of it, mm -hmm. and that sometimes, you know, that means there's a lot of constraints of what you can do in design. You can't throw a lot of extra weight and parts and complexity without losing some of what is essentially the magic of the bicycle. And there's, like the there's, appearance is that like the form well i mean in particularly like in the metal world i think that the form is really so it, it's very efficient so okay. we wouldn't go away from that for you'd, you'd be losing efficiency like that. Okay. there's trade-offs to everything right yeah you know? and uh there's there's no way for a culture that has been has been you know, marketed into saying in, into into your iPhone and the seamless piece in your hand, and and this carbon fiber frame that has all this seamlessness too, to not disconnect. They're connected. You know, and there's no getting away with that. There, there's there's people that are going to um, always be drawn. I mean, there's that generation is going to be drawn to to a very smooth. Everything flows. Everything. You know, disappears whatever it is, carbon fiber bike. And but the problem is, is that that generation or that customer is never going to understand the true unique values of the of the steel frame of 40 years ago. That that Andy Hampstein won the Giro on, and you know Greg LeMond won the Tour on, and and these these bikes that serve incredibly fine purposes right. and did them in ways that had unique uh, performance and those unique performances are rules of of, uh, of bicycle design for 100 years and that got flipped and so now we have you know too many easy choice carbon bike purchases that are out there that are wonderful bikes they're making people happy and I don't have any I ride one myself it's a breakaway carbon one though but if you really wanted to, 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 to get back into the engineering of what a bike was intended to do and, and why it does what it does, you really have to boil down and distill the bike that people left in 85, you know, that was primarily the bike of the, of the, uh, of the most celebrated teams on the walls here. What, excuse me, what about that bike? Was it the, the beauty of it or Describe. I mean, you guys can. Well, steel into... steel has its own unique properties that is different than aluminum. That is different than than carbon fiber, and there's a reason why 
a cable, a spoke, a chain, an axle, and a lot of things still remain steel and are not being replaced by carbon fiber. There's a reason, there's an inherent engineering principle, design, mechanical, module elasticity, tensile strength, all those kind of things, you know, formability, compact space, there's all these things that have to do with steel. And if you don't understand that, and if you're going for comfort, if you're going for ride performance, if you're going for, you know, a trouble-free riding experience, and you're doing that with an aluminum bike or, or a carbon fiber bike, and you don't understand the beginning point and what those values are, that you're trying to replicate and why they were valuable at one time, you're not going to get it. Well, Sam, what, how would you respond to that? I mean, I think there's what he says is right. I mean, materials have, you pick a material for the thing it's going to be best at. Right? Mm -hmm. And there's a reason that, you know, bearings are better, bearing braces are better in steel or, um, or axles are better in aluminum or steel. Um, I think when it comes to the actual frame, I mean, Tom, you said it too. There's always a compromise. Anybody who says there's no compromise, they're completely full of shit, right? Because you're always making a decision between one thing or the next. Carbon fiber, the beauty of it is you have a, you have almost limitless control in how the bike is going to ride, right? So you have a material that is extremely, extremely stiff in a certain direction, and you can place it in a way, in a shape, that changes the ride completely. So you have, you can take that thing and it looks a certain way and you can make it ride totally different by the way you orient the fibers. So that kind of control allows you to do, for me, extremely fun things in bike design. Uh, but it's true, you, you, you pick a material based on... Your purpose, right? Yeah, or your, your purpose or the intent. Experience. Exactly. John, you work with... Steel and titanium. Ty, tell us about kind of the merits of tie versus. Sorry, I left out tie. <laughs> versus, you know, carbon. And you, I'm sorry, how is tie different from, say, what Sam just said about carbon? Yeah, it has a different mix of characteristics. Um, you know, carbon fiber would win in terms of weight. Titanium excels in. Um, Kind of its its toughness, I think it doesn't require any paint um, because the rust and corrosion resistance is very high. It's resilient. It's hard to dent it or, or damage it in crashing. Um, it's easy for me to work with in terms of any kind of geometry. I want it's very adaptable. Um, the bikes tend to last a long time, and the ride comfort is, is high. It's it's not hugely unlike steel. Steel okay. has you know some some similarities. So if you were to name one thing that uh, is carbon has to offer that steel or titanium doesn't, what would that be in one word? Manipulation. Manipulation? You okay. can do whatever you want with it. Ship it any part you want, we'll do whatever you want. Vice versa. One word, Tom. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, well, first of all, I, I contend with that. I, I use carbon fiber quite a bit. I understand. I understand the value of carbon fiber. You use carbon fiber in certain areas, and you and you, there's benefit. But I know this is a this is a convoluted response. But when I said that you have to understand steel, if your goal is to understand basically the left the leaving off of a material, or the I mean, I lived through 20 years where. I actually put in the dumpster thousands of steel forks and steel tubes. I mean, you couldn't sell them. Between 1985 and 2005, there was no market. It was inventory sitting in your warehouse and no one wanted it. And it came back. Okay, it came back and there's a, and it came back for a lot of wonderful reasons, the Handbill Bike Show and people, you know, crafting you know, these beautiful works of arts and all this functional stuff. But unless you understood, and I know this is a long-winded answer, unless you understood the reason why a one-inch steel fork had value, you will never understand how to design a carbon fork that has value. Okay, so it's like a prerequisite. Okay, that. so the prerequisite of a, of an, of a car, of, okay, a car, okay. Everyone agrees in the world right now. You have the UCI, you have every organization agreeing that a carbon fiber fork 
can't break. Okay? If it breaks in all the rigorous testing that's out there, you have everyone, every lawyer, all the UCI and their, and their horsepower coming down your throat. You cannot, and, and everything is attached. So a fork that goes on a $300 or whatever OEM frame is going to go on a $1,000 OEM frame. It's a very similar similar product. It has, to, it has to have the same standard. Again, this is a long-winded answer. The reason why a steel fork is wonderful Let's hear it. is because it can bend. It can bend and bend and bend and bend and love bending and love bending and be bent back. And then maybe 20 years later, it might break. Okay? What is the most important part control? Yeah. What is the most important control part of the bicycle? It is the fork. It gives you your connection to the ground. It gives you your your feedback from the dirt. It gives you all your steering responses. You want something that's wonderful there. Okay. Okay. We don't have that now. Yeah. We have something that won't break. And therefore, it's designed <laughs> to not break, which means it's designed to not have the feedback of that old-fashioned one-inch steering column steel board. And that's part of my... <laughs> Long, I mean, I, I could talk for hours about this and why we have, we have an industry right now. Yeah. We have, I mean, this is a wonderful group of guys that, that, are, that are very unique in, their, in the size of their companies and, and the breadth of their companies and their history and all that. But if they, if they saw, I came from a point where there was no testing standard. It didn't exist. The testing standard was the body. The testing standard, <laughs> testing standard was the injured cyclist, the injured Tour de France racer on the side of the road. That was the testing standard. And now we live in a lawyer world that everything has to have an overbuilt design characteristic to it. That we can't enjoy some of the things that really are truly radical. Sorry. <laughs> Gave a talk about your bikes and stuff, and I think some that you were talking you had a camera remember which mountain bike it was. We were asking questions, you're talking about it, and one of my co workers was like, Well, what if I've got a guy who's like you know 250 pounds that can you ride this super light race bike? And you're like, I don't think I would make that bike. You know, it was something about like you, you were really pushing the envelope on. On, on steel and doing stuff that nobody else was and making these really like race bikes that Thomas was racing and yeah. uh, you know it's interesting because in other builders I've met later I think that they're a lot uh, they're so cautious they don't want to do testing and um, some of their tube spec might be particularly cautious but I got a sense in some of the work that you did that you tried a lot of things you were really willing to push things and uh, build this special lightweight bikes and to develop those well, models. What is the, for everyone, like what is the testing process? Or if we start from the design process, who's going to prototype it and what feedback? Where do you get that feedback from? What's the, how do you start up, how do you start designing a bike, Aaron? Um, I mean, I always started from the standpoint of like what the intended use is, right? So, like, what kind of experience I want to have on the bike and like what, what the goal of the product is. So, Instead of like focusing on materials from a standpoint or like yeah. from a get a, like the, the starting point, I think you know, like what Tom said is, is is pretty valuable in that like we have a huge history of like all these materials and all these different things, and they all they all work right yeah. like they all serve a purpose and they all accomplish I think what we're all looking for. I mean everybody here probably owns a carbon bike and a steel bike and a tie bike and all these fun different bikes and they're all achieving hopefully what that consumer wants. Um, so for me, it's always starting at that end. It's like, what, what are we trying to achieve? And I happen to work in steel and titanium just because it's a preferred method. And like, as engineers and fabricators, we all have like our own little like shoe boxes that we fit in. But- Well, if we think specifically, 
are you drawing on a paper napkin? Are you using CAD? Like, what it? What do you? Sure, it's like this process. Like, if you start with like a disc road bike for me, you know, then I'm. What kind of riding am I doing on it? I mean, probably not drawing on a napkin, but yeah. like at this point, right? Like, I usually a lot of it's in my head, so a lot of it's okay. kind of like swirling around. You're like take, utilizing the tools that you have, and like the whether it's materials or it's like how I know how to build a frame or the equipment that I have available to me or the knowledge that I have, and then kind of like pulling that all together to create something. Um, I, we build everything in house, so since we build everything in house, it's kind of on me to figure out how to make it. So you're getting a piece of me because it's my breadth and my knowledge. It's not like we're going to Taiwan and just like having somebody in Taiwan make it where you can leverage a bunch of people that don't know much about me, but they can make whatever. Yeah. Um, okay. Does that make sense? Yeah, so it's that makes like, sense. You get a piece of me when you buy one of our bikes. We'll talk more about kind of that customer experience in just a little bit, but John, what's your process? Um, you know, there's a lot of stuff that comes from riding, um, sometimes observing other people riding, asking them stuff to develop some ideas and people's impressions, and then I use a bike cats program to lay out those designs, which is helpful for like comparing geometry and exploring different design ideas and kind of refining those things. And then there's a little bit of sometimes actually just drawing, sketching things out to check how that's going to play out. And then through the course of building and taking notes about what things I might want to change in future iterations. Is everything in house for you as well? Yeah, it's just me building. Just you. Mm -hmm. Just John Clay. <laughs> Mr. Richie, talk to us about you. What what's the what's Richie up to? Like what's uh, well, how how are friends built? Yeah, my my life is uh, is very different than than the uh, the life of the of the. Of the of the builder, uh, so for me, it's the designer mainly and uh, engineer. I um, I'm an international company, so one of the things that you could you you need to understand is is that these guys are skunk works. They're what? Skunk works. Skunk works. Yeah, it's like specialized used to have skunk works. Okay. S works. But uh, yeah, yeah. Anyway, they can do stuff. And they can and they can use their own instincts and and they can make stuff that they feel is right. I can't. I can do a degree. I can do a degree, but I've got to work around a political system. It won't be sellable. You cannot sell it. You cannot manufacture it. You cannot bring it to market available in these countries and all these countries that you want to sell into to grow your business. Because of their individualness. Because they're a small business they're small. versus you are a larger right. small company. Okay. Um, and it, they can make something that's actually true, really, really true to who they think their end customer, what their end customer. I mean, of course, in your example, the big guy, 220 guy, I mean, Yokes was almost 220 pounds, 200 pounds. I mean, his fork was this long. The reason why that fork was that long is that fork absorbed energy. Okay, the length of that steering column between the steering, between the races was so elastic that he was hitting. So it, it forces you to understand the material, the best use of the material, the value of the size of the rider to the geography, to, to the terrain that he's riding, to the needs that he has. I mean, most people wouldn't wouldn't back then imagine that Yokes would be doing the things that he was doing, right? Right. So it was a matter of knowing my customer. And as a builder, as a small builder, as somebody that can build custom things, the value you have is you're not handcuffed by all the stupid stuff <laughs> that is going on right now in the world. And it's only gotten more and more stupid. So you're talking more globally. Yeah. <clears throat> Got it. Is there like a particular thing that bike that's coming to mind that you kind of would like to see? I can't build, build a steel board. I have I have prototyped <laughs> I have prototyped, tested, gotten to the point where it it it, it it's it almost passed the test and it's not light enough for me. I'd have to build a thousand ground form to build a three hundred ground carbon form just because it cannot at all take a move. It cannot get to the point where it yields and results in a different shape. 
if I don't, which is one of the things that I like about steel. But the world of carbon fiber has taken over in terms of, <laughs> what? <laughs> and and, and it, it's, and I, I'm, I'm just saying that's, a, that's, that's, the, that's the way it is right now. It doesn't mean it's always going to be that way. Yeah, thanks but, it, but it doesn't yeah. matter because these guys can still get under the rug and they can still get under the radar and they can do things that's wonderful. You go build your fort with them then. <laughs> I, I would be happy to introduce my my latest work to a steel a steel a yeah. small steel builder. Yeah. Okay, Sam, talk to us about the process that, of of designing a carbon sure. bike ally. So I kind of talked a little bit about already the intent for the rider and everything. But when you actually get process. to making it, so we design all in CAD. Um, so three D surface modeling. From there, you usually get printed prototypes. Oftentimes, if you're trying to prove a concept, you make a mule from that. So you take bits and parts of bikes that you already have, and then you sort of cut out a section, and you make just the part that you're trying to test. Okay. Um, and then you go out and sort of prove that that thing does what you want it to do, and et cetera. What does that mean, go out? Like, do you have people who specifically try it out for you? No, you, uh, all right. Oh, you wrote it. Yeah, okay. sure. Uh, you don't want to put somebody else on my yeah. house. Yeah. <laughs> That's one's break. Yeah. Uh, and then from there, once you're sort of happy with it, you go through a long process of 3D modeling, industrial design, etc. Then you build tooling, then you design a layup, then you make prototypes, you break prototypes, make prototypes, break them, uh, until finally you have a finished product that you're happy with. You spend some time riding it, it's ready to roll, and then you, then you take it to market. How long, what's the duration of that process? That whole process takes us about nine months. Okay. It, it totally depends on how long that first bid is. So you can be in prototype phase for years, but once you sort of set up, hey, I'm gonna turn this thing into a product, it takes, about, it takes us about nine months. Okay. Yeah. Um, well, I, uh, I repair frames. I have right. a repair shop, and I get to look at all the latest bikes, and every single bike, from you know, and uh, and I get to see how they break, and I you know I get in the good ideas, I take them, and whatever they're doing wrong, I'm, I try not to replicate. It. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and uh, and also you know like I get, you know, I fix over two thousand francs, and like I get all my clients come with like all these horror stories of how they broke their bikes, and like I come to my shop and there's like you know for like fifty bikes like hanging, and like I'm like. I would hate it if I saw one of my bikes hanging in a shop, like waiting to get fixed. And um, so I, uh, I pretty much listen to the clients. So I, I overbuild them where they're overbuilt, you know, where they, where they usually break. Uh, where do they usually break? So usually, so a top tip's a big one. In a crash, like people, you know, you're going, the, you know, you have, you're going through a turn, some guy two rows of road crashes, and then there's a pilot, and then the handlebar hits it. That's a common one. Another one is um, the seat stay. Okay. Seat stay, uh, those are the two most common ones. People, you know, someone uh, breaks a derailleur hanger, the derailleur swings all the way around, it's a seat stay, cracks the seat stay. Right? And then uh, there's a bunch of, you know, bunch of little, there's like stupid stuff that shouldn't happen. Like, like what did this happen? Like, how did this bike ever pass like this test? Or you know, like, like what though? What what can we learn about this? Like something there's so many bikes. Like, oh my okay, gosh! So there's there's. You can okay. tell Sam for an ally. No. <laughs> so I'm pretty sure it does, but like there's you know, one thing they get a lot is you know like the just because it's six hundred grams, seven hundred grams for a frame, doesn't mean it's gonna make a better rider. Doesn't mean it's gonna be you know a great bike. You know, it just means it's light. You know, and you and I've worked at bike shops and stuff like that, and you know when you're working at a bike shop, you can tell the client. All the cool things about this bike, and all these like cool components, and all this great technology, but that's gonna go in one year, come out the other, and then they go and they pick up the bike, and it's like, oh my god, that thing's so light. <laughs> How much is it? You know? <laughs> and they're like, and then everything you just sold them just goes out the window. Yeah. And it's like, this, this, I think this one's lighter. I want this one. Yeah. And then a couple months later, they come to me. It's like my bike broke. I went like I went up like front of it and it fell on a rock and it cracked. I was like. <laughs> Yeah, or they, you know, or like they were riding. I was like, I wasn't like, you know, I was like riding this fire road, and a rock got in in my tire, and like now my chains is cracked. I was like, 
you know, it's like maybe four other dogs. It's a, it's yeah. a race bike, man. It's made for like, you know, movie star to leave stages. Not, it's not made for you to like, <laughs> <laughs> it's not made for you to like, you know, take it off fire up. Well, <laughs> at this point, like to do a 700 gram road frame, yeah, your wall thicknesses and the main parts of your tubes, they are like half a millimeter yeah. thick. Half, so a half a millimeter thick, and the material is not meant for impact resistance. Right. So if you're just pedaling, no problem. Yeah. But for sort of durability, yeah. uh, it's not great. So you if you clean it up at the door of the coffee shop. Not quite that bad. If not you're if you're if you're if you're a racer and you only care about winning the race, if you have the legs and the lungs and you're super fit, great, buy that bike. If you're you know in a group ride. And you know, you're just trying to like, you know, distress from like, this, you know, you're weak or whatever. You know, well, don't buy less. like, you know, whatever, you which know. Which is most of us. Which is most. I mean, it's great. It, I mean, it makes me money, you know. Right. Like, <laughs> <laughs> it pays my rent. It helps me. It helps me. You know, stay in LA. You know, I can afford to live in the city well, because of it. That actually like, leads, that leads into another question related to this. Can I, can I just tag on? I yeah. didn't really comment on the years that I spent building bikes for custom customers. And they're all custom. Everything is custom. And the, the thing that you have to realize is, is that we live when bikes are given to athletes. Mm -hmm. And they're given oh, yeah. to younger and younger athletes. And they're subsidized by, by companies and, and, and all 30 years ago, that was unheard of. Uh, no one was given a bike. If you were on the national team, if you were possibly a friend of a builder like me, or something like that, you were maybe given a deal. Yeah. And so the value of a bike that blows up on you is, was different back then than a bike that blows up on you now. And we, we just, you know, cared in, in, in extreme ways about crashes and things like that that happened. And it was, it was like if you, if you laid your bike down in a criterium and you had a, a wreck set of wheels, you knew that was coming out of your pocket. And you, or you bent your fork and you need to visit me or whatever it is, you knew that was coming out of your pocket. And, it's a, and so if a bike is fragile, if it's thin, if it cracks, if, it's, if it needs a manufacturer warranty and all these kind of things, it's a whole different world we live in, and the and the decision that a person makes in order how they how they take responsibility for their purchases is a different is a different world. Yeah, I think the pendulum has swung, but I think we're trying to get back to that. You can you can build robustness into materials, right? Yes. It's carbon fiber is if you have half mill wall everywhere. Yeah, it's not that robust. But there's things you can do, yeah. there's added materials. You can make it robust. Not as robust as steel. Steel is extremely tough. But in a steel bike, you can't get to the, to the weight performance that you can of a carbon bike. Yeah. Um, so that's the trade-off, right? And that's what consumers have to make a choice on. Uh, and it, it's, there's, there's no right answer. There's, there's a right answer for what that person wants. Right. And that's sort of, I think that's what we're talking about here. That's what's yeah. kind of the beautiful part about it, right? Look, I use carbon fiber, and, and, it, and if done properly, it is wonderful. Right. Yeah. It is yeah, absolutely we, wonderful. I love this discussion. So, yeah. so <laughs> but the, 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 in a race for a weight number, yeah, which, is what we're, which is what we're in, and it, and it will always, and weight will always be a part of cycling. There's just no way of getting around it. It will never deliver the comfort because weight is only going to deliver stiffness. Because if it delivered comfort, it would be heavier and it would actually be um, um, uh, less expensive, probably. Yeah. yeah. What, um, I'm going to shift a little bit because we are running out of time gotten through like five questions this has been good um i'm curious about this is there something about bikes or components that has been around for too long like i think about the rear derailleur it's like this very vulnerable component and it can ruin a day pretty quickly right like yeah. what can any can you think why do we still have a rear derailleur like what i mean we have internal hub like 
Yeah, Should nobody's be. done yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> no one's done it right. It? I don't want to run anything on that. No, me neither. Yeah. <laughs> but is there like something that you think, other than the derailleur, uh, that's been around too long that we should have changed long ago? No, what? the derailleur, the derailleur hasn't been around that long. You know what's what's new about about shifting is the front derailleur, and that's and that's a unique thing. It, uh, but as far as something that protrudes from your bike that is more vulnerable, it's going to be a derailleur. There's is not there going a better to be, way. It's designed. If it's going to if it's going to shift, if it's going to be moving. It's going to add, it's going to be it's going to be in the location that it is, and it's going to work the way it works. And the problem that we have right now is that people are putting electronics in it. And so what you have is a wonderful shifting when it works right system, but as soon as you have other things happen when it when you're in the in the sticks and you need something that's durable and you need something that's going to be, you know, you're not calling mommy on your cell phone. Um, it's not going. It's a direction that'll that'll have limits. So there's a limit to the value of that part. Yeah. But I that's mean, that's the issue. There's a limit with mechanical though too. Like I've been out where. It's amazing know, how good. Broke. I'm just saying that from riding a rear derailleur for 50 years. It's amazing how good it works. It is just ah, oh, yeah, they work. You, you wouldn't believe the way the rear view derailleurs worked 50 years ago. So you <laughs> like you're a proponent of the rear derailleur. I'm totally a component of the chain, <laughs> the cassette, <laughs> and the rear derailleur. Yes, and it, in a non-electrified version. Do you do you uh, try to keep up with some trends or innovation? Like, how much pressure no, do you feel? I'm just a grandpa. That how about you, Aaron? Do you feel pressure to keep up with uh, innovation in bike? No. You just not do really. what you want? Or yeah, I mean, yeah. You're like you're lying. <laughs> do I feel pressure to do that? I feel your pressure. You do. <laughs> Occasionally, I feel pressured like outside of like what I guess would be my comfort zone, but I don't really feel like it's pressure as far as I can, like, I can design around it. You know, it's like, it's not like it's that hard to design around something that maybe I don't necessarily agree with, but there's. There's a lot of things in the industry that I don't necessarily agree with that we're just we design around anyway, but that's because we're all old and curmudgeon. And you're, you're not old. You're 32. Yeah. yeah, but I mean, I've been I've been racing bikes since I was like 14, I and like I, when I started racing bikes, I mean, steel you race on steel aluminum. Carbon bikes didn't exist then. Um, I mean, they did, but you didn't really nobody really raced on them, or they were too expensive to for bike racers to afford. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't really, no pressure. <laughs> no pressure. Sam, talk to us about innovation. Do you, does Allied feel like you're carbon? Sure. I think for sure there's always pressure, right? I mean, we are, when we decide to go down the path of making a bike, we're trying to make a lot of those bikes uh, because, you know, you're making a big investment in tooling and, and energy and effort and resources that go into producing a model. Uh, so you have to get it right. Because if you don't, you are totally screwed. Yeah. I mean, you're totally screwed. So there is pressure. There's pressure to get it right. There's a sort of a nervousness around what is, how is this industry going to move after I make this decision? Uh, so you try to move quickly and with um, looking into the crystal ball a little bit for sure. So maybe the urgency is more with the kind of the carbon technology rather than like. Uh, no, I think it's you know it's like uh, what did. Like if you were uh, at one of the first people to launch disc brakes on road bikes, right? And you're like, it's going to be 135, and it's going to be post mount. Then I'm putting my, and then you would be screwed, yeah. right? Because you just invested a load of money into into that. Uh, so you, you need to, like I said, you need to kind of look into the future a little bit, see what things are going to stick. Because when you make a decision, it's, you want Fingers it to last fast. a little bit. A little bit. Yeah. Yeah. It's funny what you said about the. You know, 135 plus now. When um, when I first started my company, I, I was partnering up with Rita, and uh, around that time, Spencer was designing like, what's the next bike we're gonna make? 
and uh, it was like, let's just make a disc brake bike. And uh, I, you know, I made uh, like the only disc brake, disc brake rate I ever made. And uh, and it had ISO mounts and 135. And um, and uh, you know, but like this is 2013, and um, they took it to their bike. Everyone psyched on it. Spencer decided to not make it, and he actually made the, the Ace, which is their current road bike, right? And um, for a while, we're like, you should have made that bike. But like, if you look at it now, like that bike's outdated. Yeah. You know. Uh, as far as my bikes, I make whatever I want. Like, my clients buy my bikes because, you know, they like what I make. And, you know, if I can, you know, have the freedom to do whatever they want, but usually they want a rim brake, road bike. Road bike. Yeah. And I was like, I want a bike like yours. Great. Just make you one, you know? Go to Steven, get fit, to fit it, and bring me the numbers. No, and I'll make a road bike. Yeah. <laughs> okay, looks like we're almost out of time. I'm gonna take audience questions, but I do have one more question. Oh. For uh, each of you, what is what is the lifespan of the bicycle, taking into account materials, but also components? So we, you know, if you think about an old steel frame that, you know, one might want disc brakes, what do we do with that? So, John. Um, yeah, that's, I mean, that was a good question. I do put disc tabs on people's old frames sometimes. Um, yeah, it's hard to say. It does seem that there's the lifespan of the frame itself, you know, which taken care of and not crashed. It could be as long as somebody's around. Um, and then they often might want to change it because their fit might change or their parts wants might change or their riding interests, things like that. So like so there's kind of the frame might last, but their interests might shift. Yeah, there's a lot of variables. Like if you were to say a year's, I mean, that's so tough, I know, but typically. Typically? Yeah, well, I get like fatigued of color sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> you can change that. Yeah, yeah, you can change I'm that. I'm with you, I change bikes yeah. a lot. You change bikes a lot. I do. Yeah. Yeah. Because of. Well, no, I mean, the, the thing is, is it. No. Color definitely helps. Color? Yeah. <laughs> uh, no, I think. Um, I mean, listen, it, you, could, you could ride a bike for the rest of your life. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's no. Parts will break, things will wear out. If the bike is well maintained, you could ride a bike for as long as. The industry will make you believe that you need a bike every couple of years. You probably don't. Back to what Tom said um, about marketing, huh? Yeah. But, I mean, to, to that, th things do change. They shift. There's an evolution. And it opens up new kinds of riding, right? So I think that, more than anything, brings people out to, to go get something new. Yeah. Yeah. The, needless, the needless changing of standards, really, is, is what we're yeah. dealing with right now. And, it, and it's only getting worse, right? Yeah, we yeah. didn't even get into that because it's, yeah. yeah. it's a big conversation in itself, for sure. Yeah, I had an engineering uh, kind of father figure, and he, he worked for Hewlett Packard. And uh, Hewlett Packard had, had very high uh, strict standards for even getting something developed. And you had to qualify, and it had to solve, first of all, it had to replace something in a very serious, uh, with very serious deficiencies. Yeah. And we're, now we're, we're we're replacing things with hardly any deficiency. We're, we're, right. And so your your nine month cycle to, to market and stuff is a very common thing you hear if you're in the industry. Every year, you you know you you're 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 told that you know someone's breathing down your neck and you know and you don't have much choice other than to introduce. And so it really isn't isn't what it should be. Introduction should be based on, is it solving a problem? Yeah. Is it improving something? Not just the shiny new thing. Right. Yeah. yeah. What do you think, Aaron? Yeah, I mean, you ride a bike for, like Sam said, as long as you really want. If you take care of it. Um, but yeah, I mean, standards are going to change. You got to, I mean, it, it's silly, but it's the world we live in. Yeah. It's, so design and iterate. We're, we all have jobs because standards change often, and yeah. we all get paid decently well because standards change. So you can complain about it, but you just you work within it. And... Okay, Kern, last. How yeah. long have you had your bike for? My current bike? Yeah. Uh, I finished it in August. 
How long do you plan to intend to keep that? Uh, it's made to last forever. Robust. Robust. It's made yeah. to last forever. And, uh, you know, like, Kim here has one of the bikes that I made, uh, like, five years ago. And it was like, she, she was riding, like, an old giant. And I was like, what size bike do you ride? I have this bike sitting in the closet. And Louis painted and I gave it to her. Yeah, I've been know. trying to break it. Yeah, and the thing was like, <laughs> breaking. Like, cause I, it's, it's a bike that I made when I first, when I first started my shop. Like, I started my business with no money, and um, when I first started, like, I had you know some materials and stuff, and I had a lot of time. And I was like, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I had no work and I had a lot of time. And I was like, I gotta make a bike, but I don't have any new tools. So I just went to like the art supply store and bought like a big block of foam and just shaped all these foam tubes. And then I, I made the bike that she's riding right now. And like when I made it, I was like, this might not work. This is totally not gonna work. Like in theory, I know, like, because before I would just buy all the tools from Envy or Dera Chai and cut and put them together. When you have no money, you know, all these tools are very expensive. So I was like, I have like a big roll of carbon, I have some, you know, half time to just make this bike. And then uh, and I never made a bike completely from scratch. Like completely from scratch, just some of the dry roll of carbon fiber and like some resin and you know. Just and you're still thing. riding it. Yeah, and it's not and breaking. I've broken two steel frames and I haven't broken this. So <laughs> I'm not saying the one's better than the other. <laughs> Maybe I've got more And uh, so, but like when I, when I made it, I was like, hopefully I didn't kill myself on it, you know? And uh, <laughs> And then, uh, and then now when she when I give it to her, I was like, you know, I wrote this, I wrote the crap out of this frame. Like you ride your bike a lot, she flies everywhere. Like she, like the worst thing you can do to a bike, she does it. Just, ah. and, then, <laughs> and then, uh, like <laughs> and then it's like, okay, like, like break it, like crash it, race it, do whatever you want. If you break it, please bring it back. I want to see you broke it. Yeah. And then, um, you know, she started riding it. Yeah. And then. Awesome. Um, but the way that I design, like the current frame, like over, all the parts are interchangeable. So if you, you know, if you want to change the color or whatever, bring it over. I can repaint it for you. If you, if you got hit by a car, bring it over. I can replace the tools for yeah, you. Yeah, all in house. And um, so you know, cool. it's made, I made it so you know people will buy this bike and ride it for the rest of their lives. Awesome. Very cool. Well, uh, I saw a hand raised. Yeah, let's take some audience questions. Yeah, so um, obviously you guys are really fantastic. I love hearing about all the materials and the considerations that go into your frame building process. But I'd love to hear about what what kind of writing you each do, and where is you know where does your inspiration come from? Like, what is your most magical kind of ride that you like to do that gets you in that Zen mode where you you know draw your inspiration from? So for me, inspiration comes on the road. Like, like riding in the dirt, I feel like I'm concentrating too much and I can't think about anything but just riding. I think the most fun I have is probably riding in the dirt, um, but inspiration comes on the road bike. But yeah, long climbs, long descents, all the things that everybody else likes. Escaping, um, going fast. Or do you mean location? Yeah, oh, I mean, spots? location, it might be like, you know, do you like riding in Europe versus, you know, yeah. Northern California, or do you like riding your, you know, your 1972 first Richie that you built versus, you know, a current, I mean, whatever. It's like whatever, whatever, like, fuels, fuels your passion for what you do today. Well, I, I would say that any anytime you can turn off the worry about cars, yeah, that <laughs> that's a big one. And if that's off road, if that's gravel road, if that's a road that's a tr that's a small little road out, you know, going, you know, between here or there. Uh, another thing that I learned as a trick early on in my uh, riding was when I when I was first introduced to riding off road on a road bike, the guy that did that knew inherently that, that it, the dirt road connections, and there's a lot of paved roads that go out and there's not a lot of traffic on them because there's a gate and there's a dirt road and then there's a connection you know, to that dirt road on the other side. And if you learn to make these loops and you learn to develop your skills as a road rider to be able to ride off-road in these dirt sections, you can make amazing, and I call them Bermuda Triangles where I'm, where I'm from. They, they like you get lost in them. 
you can you, you can turn off your worry factor and just focus on just how amazing it is and and uh, and you know and some of it um, you know you get lost and it's like the, the idea of the Bermuda Triangle came to me years ago because I I tend to get lost and when I come out the other side a lot of times it's with an idea or something I need it. Yeah, same. Uh, any any kind of ride where you can kind of zone out and you can just enjoy the process of being. I I prefer to ride alone. Come from a road background, um, but any kind of riding where I can kind of be alone and think, and yeah. it's kind of where my best thoughts come from, best ideas come from. Um, I have a good Bermuda Triangle in Santa Barbara. That's like, I mean, I love riding in Santa Barbara. I'm from there, so it's pretty good. Uh, it's pretty. It's pretty good. Uh, <laughs> But yeah, we have like up, up to our ridge top and around back down to the bottom. So it's got a little bit of everything in it. And uh, yeah, it's quiet, good views. Uh, I like doing mixed route rides with good friends. So usually road with some dirt sections. And my favorite stuff is smooth single track, whether it's on the road bike or the mountain bike. Just love that. Um, I'm fortunate enough to live here in San Monica. So. Pretty, it's pretty good here, pretty good. and you know, uh, I you know, I need to drive my bike otherwise I get depressed. I mean, I work in, you know, I'm surrounded by bikes all the time, and, and I love my job, but sometimes the last thing I want to do is like see a bike, <laughs> <laughs> you know. <laughs> but um, uh, I get a lot of my inspiration from just riding my bike. Even even when it's like I ride, I ride. You know, I grew up riding BMX, riding BMX bikes. And uh, sometimes spending some time away from my road bike is a great thing. Like I just, you know, I reconnect with friends I haven't hung out with like 15 years. And we're just riding dirt jumps together. And we're just in nature, just like, you know, we're not doing, we're not hurting ourselves. We're like borderline almost killing ourselves. <laughs> uh, and, um, um, you know, if I'm, either if I'm riding by myself and like, I, you know, my phone just doesn't ring for a day, I'll be amazed. But um, just riding with friends and either dirt, a BMX bike, or mountain bikes, or just, you know, riding with these guys, you know? Well, unfortunately, we're out of time. I, I'm sorry about the questions. I like your jersey, though. Um, <laughs> thanks, you guys, for joining us for this conversation. Thanks, you guys, so much for your insight on design in the industry. Um, I hope you guys learned some stuff. Thank you.